Ephesians 4. Wonderful book, wonderful chapter, talking about the way we operate minister one to another, which is what we were just talking about, is what Ephesians 4 is about. Okay? Ephesians 4, 1 says, uh, The prisoner of the Lord Paul beseeches you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you were called. So chapter 4 begins this section, and the whole chapter is about your walking. It's talking about your walking, and you walking is work. Okay? This is not how you get saved. This is not the doctrine that we learned in the first three chapters, which encompassed all the dimensions of the height and the breadth and the width. This is how you're supposed to work for the Lord and serve the Lord. So that's what we're, we're talking about. And when you talk about that, as we, we studied for an hour last week in verse 3, the work we're doing is the endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We've been entrusted with truth, with a message, and our work entails knowing our calling and endeavoring to keep that which Christ has put in place, which is the message of truth, the revelation mystery. Okay? And so Amos 3, 3, which I quoted last week, says, can two walk together lest they be agreed? And the answer is no. Right? And so you can stand together, you can be together, but you cannot walk together unless you're both going the same way. If you're walking separate ways, you're not walking together, you're walking away from each other. Right? And so if Ephesians 4 is about your walk, and your walk is your work, and you can't walk with someone else unless you are agreed on how to walk, then you see the issue here of endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We have to, with lowliness and meekness and long-suffering and forbearing one another in love, encourage and edify and grow one another in the knowledge of the truth so that we walk according to God's will the same way. And again, as we mentioned in verse 1, the walk here has not to do with your behavior as much as it is the path, the doctrine, right? the way that you're supposed to walk. And so that's what we're doing here, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, I mentioned last week, uh, about this bond of peace, how that we shouldn't be scared to live peacefully. And um, I, I, I got some comments like, well, what do you mean by that? Why is it a scary thing to live peacefully? Well, the scary thing is, uh, the reason why I, I think it's fearful for people to live peacefully is because it's almost like a settling down. People think of it, especially in our ambitious, success-driven culture, as a giving up to a, to a degree. And that's not what God thinks of it at all. The kingdom of God is peace. Okay, what happens when we get world peace? I mean, what, what is all the, the flurry in the world going to do once we get that which we attain? It's like poverty, for example, which has decreased, what, 30 percentage points in the last 15 years? You know, we're so used to saying, what's the biggest problem in the world? Well, world poverty. And it's going down. It will disappear in the next 10 years or so. And what happens when something is solved? You've got to find another problem, Right. Uh, or you can live peacefully <laughs> and quietly. And this is the issue with the gospel. We have the truth. We have the knowledge of the gospel. We have a solution to sin. To live in peace with one another in the body of Christ and our ministry with one another, that's what th this has to do. So we, sh we shouldn't be afraid of that. God has called us to peace in 1 Corinthians 7.15. In our marriage specifically, God's called us to peace. God's called us to peace in the body of Christ. In 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, Pray for those in authority, the leaders, the kings, that you may live a quiet and peaceable life. Right? which people relate with country living or something, right? Well, there's not a bad thing there to, to pray for a peaceful life. And so, uh, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace is a good thing. Not keeping the bond in peace looks like when you start to bite and devour one another. Galatians 5.15 says, If ye bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And so, apparently, Paul says, even though it says don't bite and devour one another, there will be a time when you use your teeth and you devour flesh, okay? That's what the bite and devour is. You're going to walk in your flesh toward one another and see their flesh, and that's where the biting and devouring happens. And Paul warns there in Galatians 5.15, he says, when, when that happens, because we're all in our flesh, and none of us are perfect, right, even after our salvation, that don't be consumed one another. That means your strength, your being, your existence needs to be rested and, and, and secure on the knowledge of who you are in Christ. Right? Because when someone bites you and it starts attacking your flesh or in a fleshly response reacts the way that maybe they shouldn't have, you're going to have to stand on something more than how people treat you. Right? You're going to have to stand on something more than even how you treat other people. You need to stand on, on the truth of who God made you in the gospel of Jesus Christ so that when you're in ministry with one another, when it happens that there's flesh responses, it doesn't move you even still. 
you see. That's a hard thing, but it'll help your relationships, not only with, with, with each other, but, but your understanding with God as well. So, the, the issue in Ephesians 4 with us doing ministry and endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, of course, is that the world does not know the way of peace. And the Bible says the way of peace is the way of truth and the way of righteousness. That's the way of peace. Romans 3 says the way of peace they have not known, right? I think it was like 12 years ago now, man, a long time ago, 12 years ago, we taught a lesson on the way of peace. And uh, you all remember this, right? No? Okay. Uh, the way of peace. And it had to do with this issue of Romans 3, where it says the way of peace they have not known, talking about sinners in the world, including you, right? Because the world thinks it knows how to get peace, but the Bible says that's not the way of peace. And you, you do a study on the scripture, and, and in light of especially the revelation of the mystery, and you find that the way of peace is in knowledge of truth. This also dovetails what we were talking about earlier, about comfort and, and, and this sort of thing, peace and circumstances. It has to do with us knowing truth, knowing what's right. When you don't know that, even if you want it, you can't get it. You see? So knowing the way of, of peace is knowing the way of truth. This is why doctrine comes in Ephesians 1 through 3. In Ephesians 4, we're, endeavored, we're in to an endeavor to keep this unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Okay? Romans 12, verse 18, I list a few verses here just quickly to rattle off that talk about <clears throat> this need for peace that is accompanied by truth. And without truth, you can't have peace. Romans 12, 18, if it be possible... Paul says, as much as liveth, uh, lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So the instruction isn't live peaceably with all men, even though that's ultimately what it is. It's if it be possible. And so if the idea of living at peace simply means coexist, then of course it's possible. We've all been coexisting every day of our lives on the planet. I mean, trying to shoot each other down, but we're, there's a big world, you know. But it says if it be possible. Well, possible according to what? According to other people's beliefs, according to what the truth is, as much as lieth in you, it's what you know to be right. Romans 14, 17, when talking about peace among those in the church, Paul says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so meat and drink, we know according to the doctrines of grace, the doctrines of what Paul teaches, that meat and drink, there's no law regarding what you eat and what you drink. There is under the law, but not under grace. And so, therefore, the kingdom of God that Paul's preaching here is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, right, and peace and joy. So, peace is accompanied by knowing true doctrine and what is right, okay? <clears throat> Romans 14, 19 says, Let us, therefore, follow after the things which make for peace. And people stop and say, there you go. Peace. Well, the sentence continues, and things wherewith one may edify one another. You see, inevitably, when you want, and you have the, the purpose of trying to grow people, the purpose of walking, of working, of doing ministry, which is to see people grow into the knowledge of the truth, it's going to require exercise, it's going to require uncomfortability, it's going to require your patience, their grace, it's going to, it's going to have times where people are biting and devouring, you're going to have to know not to be consumed. You know, it, that's the hard work, and it would seem like it'd be much more peaceful for you personally if you just would not walk in that way, right? If you would not minister, just don't do the ministry and you will live more at peace. You see, but this is the issue is God has called you to walk worthy of the vocation where you were called to walk. So you've got to do it. Well, it's 419. So the things that edify one another is what you're focused on to bring peace. Because as you grow together and you build together, that's where peace occurs. Romans 14, 21. It says, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. I bring up this verse because typically the only one people want to follow is the offended part. He says, don't do anything whereby your brother is offended. And by that word offense, they define it in the 21st century way, and it, which means that if it doesn't please someone and they're offended, then you got to stop. I mean, offense is a crime in the postmodern world. If someone's offended, it's their right to tell you what you can't do anymore. That's what culture tells us now, right? If I say or do something and it offends someone else, they can shut me up. They can take my property. They can, well, this is not, not according to truth. And it's not what Romans 14, 21 is saying either. Okay, the word offense in your Bible always has to do with a transgression, a crime. You harming someone's property, someone's truth, God specifically. When you commit an offense, what have you done? Committed a crime, you've transgressed, right? So if you commit offense towards your brother, what have you done? You've transgressed against him. First Corinthians 8 says you've harmed him or you've sinned against Christ by hurting him, right? 
So here it's talking about you doing anything, drinking wine, eating flesh. Now, why would eating flesh be a problem? Because there were Jews in this early church who God had told them not to eat pork, not eat those things. And here, here's people coming along who are Gentiles saying, well, I know the doctrines of grace. I'm going to eat these things anyway. Right? Not caring whether or not they hurt or harm the conscience of the other. Right? I gave the example earlier. I love the discussion that gives me these illustrations but, uh, of how, you know, early on in right division, how we would talk about God's intervention. So soon, so too early, too early. And, and what, the problem with that was, it's not that it wasn't true. The problem with that was is that it could harm people who are not ready to understand that truth. They need to learn that truth, but you've got to be patient for them to grow in the knowledge of it. Or you can do some damage. Right? You can hurt people. And there are people who are turned away because they hear things they're not ready for, and it's an offense. You see, so that's the type of thing Paul's talking about here. But he says that you need to bring them to a knowledge of it. And so that requires that patience. But he says, it's not good that you do anything whereby your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. The definition of the offense here is found in the verse. What is an offense is what causes your brother to stumble or what causes your brother to be weak. That is how you offend him. Okay. The weakness here has to do with these people not knowing what grace doctrine teaches and them thinking drinking wine and eating flesh is an acceptable behavior. If they don't know grace doctrine, why would you do that? Right? If you don't know grace doctrine, why would you do this? Because God told you in the Bible not to drink wine and God told you not to eat that flesh. Right? And so in their mind, they're going, God told me not to do that. Okay? So they're, they're not going to do it until you come along and say, eh, it doesn't matter. And now they're going to do it, not because they understand anything different, but because they're, they think it's okay not to obey God. You see, this is the offense. This is the harm. This is the stumbling stone. And so you have to be careful of putting those in the way of, peop of people. Um, the goal is for them not to be weak, to be strengthened. Verse 22 says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemns not himself in that thing which he allows. The idea there is if you have the strength of faith, okay, then... Have it to yourself before God, is what it's saying. Until your brother grows in the knowledge of the truth, then you can have your strength of faith together with him. You see, so I can't go through all of chapter 14. It's a wonderful chapter, but verse, chapter 15 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Do you see the context? There's weak brothers and strong brothers. It's not that both people are equal and you can't say anything against me and I can't say anything against you. It's that there's a strong uh, knowledge of truth and there's a weak knowledge of truth. And the, the, the danger is that the strong person will pull the weak so hard that the weak, you're going to be dragging them, right? And, and suddenly you're no longer walking together. You got a slave thing, a dependency going on where they're just following you and they don't understand how you're walking the way you are. You see? And so this is, this is the problem. So you have to bear the infirmities of the weak. You've got to walk slower so that instead of pleasing yourself by running in liberty, uh, you can help them come to the knowledge of the truth. Even Christ pleased not himself, but what did he do? He died on the cross. Right? I mean, <laughs> he died on the cross. So he cut his life short for the sake of others. And that's the idea of you and I as well in our ministry work. So going back to Ephesians chapter 4 here. I'm just trying to put a period on Ephesians 4, 3 as we talked about it for an hour last week and what it means to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Peace means we need to grow people in the knowledge of truth, which means that included in this idea of, of a bond of peace is a charity and, and love and compassion towards others to grow, which means when they have it wrong, we need to have correction, rebuke, uh, admonishment, exhortation, warning with the intent and love for them to grow. Okay, and that's what Romans 16 deals with in other places as well. What we don't do is keep the unity of the Spirit, which we've already talked about, is something we all have in the body of Christ. When we're saved, we are united into Christ's body. Okay, we're one with one another and in, in the Lord. We do not keep that by lordship, which creates a slave system, right? You have to do what I say, right? We don't do it by lordship. We do it by laws, which is legalism. Right? And so in order to keep the unity of the Spirit, we're going to have certain rules that you do here. It's not by laws. It's not by ignorance either. You don't keep the unity of the Spirit by saying, well, we just won't talk about the differences unless you're ignorant. So we keep the unity of the Spirit, which is going to be the topic of the rest of the chapter, by, I, I wanted to keep up my alliteration here, so that's the L words, but by leadership or example, which is what Paul's going to say. Okay, by example. The difference between leading someone 
and lording something over someone is that if you're the king, right, you have servants, you have slaves, you have people who must follow you at fear of death, right? A leader is someone who starts walking and people follow him. You do not lead by putting someone in shackles and say, here I go. <laughs> uh, you're not leading anyone. You're pulling them and they have to follow you by force. So leadership example has to do with, well, I'm going to go this way and this way is according to truth, right? If you want to follow me, then follow me as I'm following truth. That's what Paul says, wasn't it? Follow me as I follow Christ. He didn't say, you've got to follow me because I'm your Lord. I'm your ruler. I'm your apostle. Okay, he said, I'm following the truth. Christ gave me the truth. So leadership, love is another motivating factor. This is how we keep the unity of the Spirit is love. And it's going to say in Ephesians 4, uh, 15 and 16, that we speak the truth in love and that we edify one another in love. The motivation for our correcting, rebuking, and learning and growing together is love towards the Lord and towards each other. And then the third L there is learning. Okay, we keep the unity of the Spirit by learning. If no one learns what the truth is, then we, are, we, we don't know what peace is. We don't know what the unity of the Spirit is. We have to learn. Okay, and so leadership, love, learning, th this is the way we keep the unity of the Spirit. Okay, when our mind is on the mind of Christ, then we're not looking at each other's flesh. We're not going to bite and devour one another. But instead, we're standing on the strength of the knowledge of who Christ is, what he's done for us, and we can have peace with one another that Christ has already given us. Okay, so that, that's the period on Ephesians 4, verse 3. Now, in verses 5, 6, and, well, 5, 6, and uh, 7, 4, 5, 6, and 7, um, is a very popular passage dealing with some unities. Now, what Paul is doing here is going to describe these seven things, some people count nine or ten of them, where it says there's one, one this, one that, one the other thing. What he's not doing okay, is saying, here's a statement of faith. That's not what's going on. The emphasis actually is not on the Lord, the faith, the spirit, the baptism. It's on the one. One. That's because the context of Ephesians 4 is not trying to teach you some doctrine, which we learn in chapters 1 through 3. It's trying to show you the unity we have around these things that we've learned. Okay, that's what this is. And so, if you want to learn the doctrine of the faith, the baptism, the spirit, you go to chapter 1, 2, 3, and we'll see many references to these ones back to the first three chapters. But what he's saying here is that we need to keep the unity, that word unity. Okay, you, un you can understand Latin, right? You say, I didn't, I didn't study Latin. But you know it whether you think so or not. How many wheels does a bicycle have? Two. How many wheels does a unicycle have? One, Right? And so you understand unicycle is one cycle, bicycle is two cycles. And so if there's a unity, there's one. If there's a trinity, there is, how many wheels does a tricycle have? Three. Wow, you guys are Latin geniuses. I know we went through Latin, you studied all that stuff. Your English language communicates, okay? And so in Ephesians 4, you keep the unity, the singularity, the oneness together that we have. We, we often use the word communion or the common union that we have, the unity. We're all one in Christ. And that's what Paul's going to say here. There's a reason. Because there's one body, one spirit, there's one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And this is something we all have in common. There's one, you see. And so we have unity around these things because they're one that we all share. All right? And by the way, when you're doing ministry work with people, it's a good place to start with what you have in common. It's a bad way to do ministry, to right out the gate say, hey, aren't you those devils over there that teach false doctrine? You know, well, now you've got to fight on your hands, right? And uh, sometimes Christians do ministry this way. They'll poke the argument. You know, they'll start the argument. Here's the argument. And, and, and when you have an argument started, um, especially among people who aren't strong in, in grace and faith and this sort of thing, which could be you or the other person, uh, the only real goal of either side of the argument is to win. And that is not what the conclusion ought to be. We're trying to see a soul saved or a soul come to knowledge of the truth. And you winning the argument doesn't accomplish either. Right? Well, if I win, they have to be saved. Well, why do they have to be saved if you win? It's still their choice, their belief. Well, if I win, they have to come to knowledge of the truth because I proved them wrong. They may disagree with you. You see, you winning an argument is fruitless because it has to do with their faith, with God's work and working in them, you see. 
And so rather than starting the argument saying, can I win this argument or not, you ought to think, well, how can I have this truth work in me so that I know it, and that it works in me, works out of me, so that when I talk to people, I can talk to them to, to, to edify them, to grow them. Okay, that's different. Okay, your approach to help someone grow or to help someone is different than I want to argue with this person and win. It's going to be different. Because when you're in an argument just to win, uh, you don't care who you destroy, right? And you'll, you'll use all sorts of tactics and techniques, and they exist, in order to destroy the opposition, right? But if you're trying to help them, you're trying not to destroy them. Which may mean that you lose the battle, right? It may mean that you are quiet about certain things because you know what they need to learn first is this. And so I'm not going to deal with that right now. You know, because you're trying to help them grow, right? And so starting out with things that you have in common with someone is a great place to start in ministry. When you have someone disagrees or someone comes up to you and wants to argue with you about something, don't even go there, right? Because their starting the argument isn't as good, is just as bad as you starting it. And nothing, nothing fruitful is going to come of it. So take away the argumentative battle where there's a table and you're on, both, on either side of the table lobbing bombs at each other. Instead, get on the same side of the table and say, what do we have in common? Right. You see, that sounds very ecumenical of you, Justin. Well, I'm trying to be charitable <laughs> because the goal is to grow. And what you, ha what you should have in common, and, and what I've told you a hundred times, is to start with the gospel. Right? There's no reason to argue about the Bible with someone who doesn't even believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no reason. Which should save you from a lot of arguments you have with atheists and skeptics and other, other people who want to argue with you about what the Bible teaches, and they're not even saved. What does it matter to you if you don't even believe the Bible? You have to believe it before you can understand it. 1 Corinthians 2 says this. Right? Because this book requires faith in it for it to make any sense. That's why. It's not that it's not written in their language, it's written in English, but if you don't believe it, then it's nonsense. You see? So, what do you have in common with someone? Maybe all that you have in common with someone is that you're both people born into the same generation, right, and understand the, the problems with ourselves and in the world. Maybe that's it. Because you know that too, right? You were once a sinner that needed God's grace. So you start there, right? Hopefully, if you're talking to someone who says they're a Christian, you start with the gospel. That would seem to be the lowest common denominator if they say they're a Christian. Unfortunately, many times, they're not. But that's where you start anyway. Okay, but Ephesians 4 is talking about these things in the body, in our ministry work, that unite us, that we have in common. In fact, not only do we have them in common, but there's only one of them, right? Which is going to help our ministry work. When we talk about where's the buck stop or how are you and I differ, you and I do not differ in these points. Now, he's going to go on after this, these, 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 these few verses to talk about places that we do differ, right? Because in ministry work, this happens. But in these places, we do not. And this is going to be very helpful for your personal ministry and ministry towards others. Okay. Uh, something else I need to mention before we go through these one by one is that each one of these unities concern the body of Christ. They do not concern every person at every place in the Bible. Remember we talk talking about ministry work. Ephesians 4 is a ministry work chapter, which means it's only talking to people who are able to do ministry work, who are in the body of Christ to do ministry work. That's you and me who are saved, right? So it's not talking about everyone at all times. It's not talking about everyone in the Bible. It's not even talking about everyone in the Bible who is God's people. This has no application to Adam. He's dead. It has no application to Abraham, okay, as far as directly speaking to him. It wasn't revealed then. There are things in this list of ones that we have in common that you do not have in common with David or Moses. You understand? They're different. This is to the body of Christ, instructions for the church today. Right? And so our unity of the Spirit is around what he says, one body, one spirit, one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay, there's a time where there was no baptism. I mean, go back far enough, there was none. <laughs> and then there was one, and then there was two, and then eventually there's 12 different baptisms in your Bible, so which one is it? All right, but we'll get to that. Something else interesting to see about this as we read through it in verses 4, 5, and 6 as we saw in chapter 1, we saw again in chapter 3, the Trinity is taught here. Okay, the Trinity is here. In, chapter, or in verse 4, you see the Spirit, one body, one spirit, one calling, one hope you're calling. In verse 5, you see Lord, well, that's going to be Jesus Christ. And in verse 6, you see the Father, Father, Son, and Spirit. Only oh, it's in reverse, the Spirit, Son, Father. 
Okay? You see the three. And yet it says in verse 5, there's only, or verse 6 rather, there's one God. One God, yet three that are called God. And yet the three are different. That is the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so don't have the whole time to speak about that, but it is there. First John 5, 7 says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Right? You see it here in Ephesians 4 as well. And so uh, it's found there. Now, it's also interesting to see the things surrounding each one of the persons of the Godhead. In verse 4, this one spirit, which is God, is in line with the one body and the one hope of your calling. Apparently, verse 4, one way to think about that is your walk, your ministry, with the Spirit. What is that concerned with? And in verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, this concerns your walk toward or your relationship with Christ. He's your Lord. It's the faith that Christ revealed. And your baptism is you being identified with Christ. You see, so it has to do with Christ. And in verse 6, it's your walk toward or with a relationship to the Father or more generally with, with the God, the Godhead. Okay, and we'll see that as we get to it. Okay, so that's a neat little observation that you may find profitable to see the Trinity's in here. And each verse deals with a person of the Trinity and their, your relationship and walk toward them and their ministry. Okay, to you. So let's get through the list here. It says there is one body. One body. Now this one body is not yours. Because remember the list here is, is focusing on the one, the unity we have. This means it's describing things we have in common. You and I do not have the same body. <clears throat> For some of you, if I had your body, my wife would be happier. For some of you, you know, she would not be. Uh, but it, we do not have the same physical body. Right? But the verse says one body. And it says we have the unity of one body. So it's not talking about your body. Right? This is obviously talking about the body of Christ, of which Paul has already spoken of in Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, 23, <clears throat> it says that he gave all things... Uh, or he gave him, gave Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. You see, if you are saved, that means you heard the gospel of your salvation, you trusted it, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are made <clears throat> the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the new creature. That's what it is. It wasn't Israel, a nation on the earth that God founded. It wasn't the Gentiles, the people that God created and split at the Tower of Babel. It was a new creature, the body of Christ, the church. And that's what you are. And everyone who's saved is a part of that. <clears throat> this will help to solve a lot of divisions in Christianity, I think, who will try to limit membership into the body of Christ by certain things that you do. Right? But here it says you cannot. You are in the body. We, we have in common the body of Christ. We are one body. Everyone who's saved has a membership in this, which not only exists here tonight in this room, but also people outside the room who are saved. Different churches if they're saved. Different times if they've been saved in this dispensation. They're part of the body of Christ. But see, this is a very unifying idea. This will also help you in your ministry have the mind of Christ. Because as you think of someone, and you see them walking in their flesh, in the ignorance and darkness that they had in their flesh, and yet if they're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, you consider them, just as you, as being a member of the body of Christ. Because there's one body. There's not... The one body that's for the newbies, and then a better body that's for all of us who are stronger. There's not that. You're all in the same body. There's only one. Okay? So you see what he's doing here. He's trying to show you how to work and do ministry towards one another. There's one body. Okay? There's no division in it. Romans 12, verse 5 has the same sentiment where in Romans 12, and in this book, as Paul's talking about our ministry towards each other and, and, and in the church, he says in verse 5, we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And so you, you've heard the, the motto of the three musketeers, right? All for one and one for all, right? Uh, th they said that, uh, and yet th they weren't saying that without principle. The musketeers were fighters, right? Defenders, guards. Of what? Of principles, of things they stood for. And as a musketeer, they stood for these things, and in this group, they were all for one and one for all. It's the same thing in the church of the body of Christ. There's the gospel, there's truth but on which we stand, and as members of that body, we are one body. Okay, and so one, one body for all people in this church is what he's talking about here. We're members one of another. Let's move on in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 4, there's one body, there's one spirit, Right? It's this one spirit that Ephesians 1.13 says you are sealed by. 
Okay, that 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one spirit you are baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Greek, male or female, whatever it is, you're in one body by one spirit. Okay, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says that you have the communion of the spirit. Again, this is significant. You're talking about doing ministry with other people. It's such a joy and a comfort and a, a pleasure to know, oftentimes, sometimes it's, it grieves them, to know that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Okay, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul brings that up among people who forget that, and we often do that as well, but the Holy Spirit dwells in us. But it's the same Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that dwells in me, that dwells in you, okay, that dwells in the other person in the body of Christ. It's not a different spirit. And that's comforting, because as the Spirit teaches us and reveals things in 1 Corinthians 2 and, and, and compares spiritual things to spiritual things, that means your brother and sister in Christ can understand the things you understand from God's Word, the book the Spirit wrote. Because there's one Spirit, right? It's not that, that, that you have more Spirit or less Spirit or a different Spirit. We all have one Spirit, okay? Everyone who's saved does. Which ought to worry you when people are talking about different Spirits in the church. It should really worry you because there's only one. It's the Holy Spirit. And as I wrote, um, I think it was a Saturday, the seminar, I didn't get a chance to talk about it because we had the seminar. Did you all read my article about ghosts? I wrote about ghosts uh, the weekend of the seminar. And uh, I, I, at the beginning I said that Christians really take the existence of ghosts and devils lightly. They either make it a fiction and, and as if it's a fun type of thing to, to deal with uh, and, and you know, make it a part of festivals, or they're scared to death of them not knowing what they are and superstitious, you know, and that sort of thing about them. But uh, then I said, as a Christian, you have to believe in ghosts. Which immediately, just saying that, I know how provocative that was, the world just rejects you. The scientific community rejects you, right? And of course, I reject them right back in their unbelief about the reality of existence. But you have to leave a ghost. Why? Because don't you know the Holy Ghost dwells in you? God is a ghost. <laughs> God's a spirit. So do ghosts exist? Well, if God exists, ghosts exist. You see? But the thing is, God's spirit, God's a spirit, but there are many spirits that exist. The Bible tells you about this, right? Spiritual beings and things. And the, the instruction throughout the Bible has always been from God to make sure you come to spiritual truth through me. Because there are other spirits, and if you don't, if you don't go through me, but go through them. Through sorcery, divination, witchcraft, whatever the means, you go through another spirit, right? You will be deceived, you'll be captive to lies, you will not come to the truth. It'll harm you more than help you. God's always said that, right? And so we believe in one God, one Spirit. Right? It's the Holy Spirit. And it's this one Spirit that dwells in us when we believe the knowledge of the truth. He's then able to seal us and dwell in us, which means that we're not the possession or the claim of any other spirit. Christians ask, can Christians be uh, possessed by devils? Not if you're possessed by Christ. If you're possessed by the Holy Spirit, then you can't be laid claim to by any other. But that doesn't mean anyone that names the name of Christ can't be devil-possessed, because that doesn't mean you're saved. Right? Be saved, be sealed with the Holy Spirit, and come to the knowledge of the truth, and that is the guard against evil spirits, against wrong spirits, against spiritual wickedness in high places, and a hundred different other things like that. So the one spirit brings us together, literally, into the body of Christ, but also because he dwells in us. Okay? Philippians 2 verse 1 talks about the fellowship of the Spirit. And so this work we do together is with the work of the Spirit. In fact, Galatians 5 describes the fruit of the Spirit that can be born out of us when we walk in the Spirit, right? It's the same fruit that applies to you that applies to me. So if we walk in the Spirit, you will bear the same fruit that comes from me if I walk in the Spirit, because it's the same Spirit. That's one. All right, am I hounding too much yet? One other thing about the Spirit, and we'll move on is that a lot of people read this one spirit and they say, there it is, there's only one spirit, that's why the church began at Pentecost. You ever heard that? One spirit. And when did the Holy Spirit come down? Pentecost, Acts 2, right? So if there's only one spirit, then the church began at Pentecost. Right? Well, this is going to be a problem. Because the spirit's not like, it's, the spirit's not a thing. The spirit is God. The spirit's a person, Right? And just as God's will has changed and what he does has changed throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit and what he does has changed as well. It, it's news to a lot of people to, to realize that 
Acts 2 and Pentecost is not the first time the Holy Spirit shows up on this planet. You understand this? It's so much emphasized, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the tongue talking, He came down from heaven. And, but that's not the first time He came down from heaven. That's not the first time He's on the planet. He's God, after all, which means He's omnipresent, quite literally. But it's not the first time He manifested Himself. Okay? He's all over the Old Testament, which is interesting. Well, maybe all over is a stretch, but you definitely read Him throughout there. Okay? Judges 15, 14. How do you think Samson knocked down those pillars and killed those thousand men? It says the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. That's not Jesus. That's not the Father. That's the Spirit of the Lord. Jehovah Lord, by the way. God. Spirit's God. Okay, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And the Spirit was upon all of those judges. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David as his anointed one. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul and made him prophesy. Saul of the Old Testament. Okay. Psalm 51, when David sinned, he prayed to God, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Right? In Proverbs 1, it talks about the Holy Spirit being poured out on people. In Proverbs 1. So the Holy Spirit exists back in the Old Testament and does a work. But you know what? The Holy Spirit in you is not going to give you superhuman Samson strength. He's not doing it. Right? Okay, he doesn't do it to anyone. Even the Pentecostals who claim they can heal, they're not giving Samson strength. So they, they pull out, Who were those guys back in the 90s that tore the phone books up? The power team? Yeah. Yeah. Doing it for the Lord, right? Obviously anointed with the Spirit. Or they worked out, you know, 25 hours a day. This, it's the same Spirit. It's one Spirit that, that, that makes us a part of the body of Christ, that dwells in us, okay? But the same Spirit has different ministries. He does different things. And so it's important we realize that what the Spirit does in Acts 2 is going to be different than what He's doing today. And you learn that from, again, studying the Scripture and finding out what He says He's doing. Okay, let's move on here. There's one hope of your calling. We're put into one body by the one spirit, and we have, because of our position in this body of Christ, one hope of a calling. We have a calling. And by the way, this calling and this hope that we all have is the same. We have one. One. Doesn't it say one hope of your calling? And yet Christians want to make this, God has a special purpose and plan for your life, a special calling for you. It's different than a calling for me. What is this doing in the body of Christ? It's hindering the ministry of the body of Christ is what it's doing. Because it says here that we all have in common one hope of our calling. Which means what God called me to do, he called you to do. There's one. If we did that, we'd have more unity and maybe we'd get some work done. Because it wouldn't be just me doing it. It'd be me and you and everyone else that's supposed to be doing it, right? But if I think my calling is this and you think your calling is that, then suddenly we're getting no work done for the Lord, right? And so one hope of your calling is an important unity that we have these things in common. But then again, it requires that we know what that is, right? And so this is why he's not listening here a statement of faith. There's so much more doctrine in here, but he already told you that in Ephesians 1 through 3, what the calling was, okay, what the hope was. And so we read about Ephesians chapter 1, for example, that he prays in chapter 1, remember? He prayed that you would be enlightened to know what is the hope of his calling. In Ephesians 1 verse 18, and in Ephesians 2, he says in verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ in heavenly places. Gives you that hope there. Or what about Ephesians 2, where he says, you're without hope. And then the next verse says, but now, but now what? You have hope, right? And we all have that same hope. And it says, you're made a new creature. Of two, he made one new, and he made you a part of God's building, and you're all part of that. One hope of your calling, you see. And so this is what brings us together in ministry work and what brings us together to do ministry work. So thank God for his spirit. Thank God for the body of Christ. Thank God for the hope of his calling that brings us together, right? And what we need to do is, out of love and out of example and leadership, to help people learn what that is so that we can keep that unity, right? As we walk in ignorance, or if I try to lord something over you, then we're not going to do that. You'll think that I'm specially anointed from God and have a special calling from God that you don't, right? And that is me not keeping the unity of the Spirit. And so for me to claim a special anointing that you don't have is me dividing the body of Christ, is it not? You see what I just did there? Even though if you all followed me, we could walk in peace, right? That's not the, the goal. The goal is God's calling for you is the same calling for me, and we're all one body. And see, so this is the idea. Let's move on to verse 5 here. It says, one Lord. There's one Lord. And of course, this should be obvious. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, the phrase Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned 82 times in the New Testament in your Bible. 
82 times, and 65 of them are mentioned by your apostle, Paul. Okay? It's interesting. It may have something to do with the message that Paul was preaching. One Lord. You say, well, there's always been one God, but he's not saying that here. He'll say that later. He's talking about one Lord. Okay. What's this mean that there's one Lord? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it says in verse 5, Paul says, there are lords many. So like I said, this does not apply to everyone at all time. In the Old Testament, was it true or false that David had a special anointing that other people in Israel did not? True. Okay. Samson, I brought him up as the example. He had the spirit that others did not. Right? So you couldn't claim everyone in Israel, one spirit. No. Because the priests were people that can go in that Holy of Holies, and you couldn't. Right? Right? And there was Israel and the Gentiles. So you couldn't say one spirit unites us all. But in the body of Christ, yes, one spirit, one body, one calling, one Lord. In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5, this is going to be liberating. Paul says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods many and lords many. See the lords many there? The gods many even? Okay. There's many lords. What does this mean? Well, perhaps you've heard of the medieval language. When people talk about ladies and lords and things like this, right? The Lord, the word itself has to do with your master. The Lord uh, has to do with your head. It's really literally what it is. It's your head. And so when he says one Lord, he's saying one head. Head of the body, right? And you say, okay, fine, he's, there's one. But that has a lot of implications. Number, first of all, there's not two heads, which goes far in the body of Christ, your marriage, and other places as well. There's one Lord, one head in the body of Christ, okay? But also... That there's one Lord means there's nothing between you and him. Right? Because in Israel, there was God, who was the God of Israel. Then there was the high priest. Then there were priests. Then there were Levites, who weren't necessarily priests. Then there were the other 11 tribes. Then there were Gentiles. Right? So could a Gentile just walk up to the Holy of Holies, plant down the Ark of the Covenant? Well, he couldn't do that. He had to bless and obey Israel Israel had to obey the priest. The priest had to follow the, whole, the high priest. And the high priest had to walk in, you know, carefully, you know, into the Holy of Holies based on what God told him. Right? And so you have this hierarchy in the nation of Israel that God was operating through. In the body of Christ, it says you're all members of one body. And who's the head of the hand? The head. Who's the head of the shoulder? The head. There's no hierarchy in the body of Christ. We're members one of another, but there's only one head, and you're all answerable to him. Romans 14 says, you're accountable to him you're, for yourself. Romans 14 says, we're all accountable to him. And so you're not accountable to me. I'm not accountable to the denomination, and then they're accountable to God. You know, put the Pope in there somewhere. That's not how it works in the body of Christ. There's one Lord which means if I'm not doing something according to the one hope and the one calling and the, and the one spirit, you can say, I need to obey my Lord and yours. You have no authority over me. I have one Lord, right? That's liberating, folks. And that you follow Jesus Christ alone, okay? Which was the topic at the seminar. So this one Lord has implications. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6 says, To, to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. This is a famous verse that people try to use to disprove that Jesus was God, because the verse says, there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. And they read that as if there's, there's two, and there are two. Okay, There's actually three, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God. Okay. Jesus Christ has proven to be God in this verse, however, because it says, the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. So the all things are applied to both the Father and the Son. They both have an attribute of God. Okay? He's one Lord over all. Okay? And so, one Lord in the body of Christ. First Corinthians 1, verse 9. We can go back here. Notice how it uses this teaching of one Lord Jesus Christ to provide unity in the Corinthian church. Because there were factions in the Corinthian church following different men. Right? And he teaches here that it's not what the men, it's not about the men, it's about Jesus Christ. And by the way, who's the minister of Jesus Christ to you Gentiles? Paul. It's not about the man, Paul. 
It's about Jesus Christ and what he said. Verse 9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. Do you see the unity there? One God, one faith, one calling, one fellowship of his spirit, one Lord. In that verse, verse 9. Now I beseech you, brother, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Our Lord. He doesn't say my Lord. Right? Our Lord. We have the same Lord. One Lord. He says, I beseech you that you all speak the same thing. This comes to the one faith we'll get to in a moment. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. He, we want to, have the, to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, right? So he's trying to bring us together. But how is he going to do that for the next 12 chap 15 chapters in 1 Corinthians? Rebuke, correction, rebuke, correction, admonish, doctrine, doctrine, rebuke, correction. That's how Paul keeps the unity of the Spirit. He says, I beseech you by one Lord and one spirit, and one faith, and that you all come together in one mind. And here's how you're going to do that. You're wrong, and he's wrong, and this is true, and that's wrong. And see, he's, he's put people together around the truth, you see, correcting those errors. But verse 11 says, here's the issue. It's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe. The first thing he deals with, before he deals with the doctrine even, is who's in control, which I'm taking from Karis. Question earlier. Who's, who has the authority? Who's the Lord? Is it Peter? Is it Paul? Who's the Pope? Who's in charge? Right? And he says, it's been told to me there are contentions among you. For every one of you says, I'm a Paul, I'm a Apollos, I'm a Cephas, I'm of Christ. You see, there's an authority problem. There's only one Lord in the body of Christ. That's what Paul's going to say. And he's going to say, that one Lord Jesus Christ tells us this is the truth. Right? And so if you love Christ, at the very end of this book, the last two verses, he says, if you love Christ, you'll do what I say. <laughs> Which is only Paul could say this, by the way. Him being the servant of Christ to you Gentiles, right? This says Christ gave him those words, but in verse 13 he says, As Christ divided, was Paul crucified for you? We have one Lord, one body. Christ is not divided. And Paul was not crucified for you. And you are not baptized in the name of Paul, right? Verse 14, I thank God but I, th that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. Right? It's only the name of Jesus, folks. It's only one Lord that is over the body of Christ. And so, in this context here, Paul's talking about baptism specifically because baptism associates you, identifies you with a person. That's what baptism does. Right? And people were baptizing and saying, well, I was baptized by Peter or Apollos or Paul, and thus they're the one I follow. And Paul's saying, no. He says, Christ is the only Lord of us all. Peter's Lord was baptized, or was, was, was Christ, okay? And they, they preached in his name, that water baptism, right? And so Paul says, I baptized, I, I thank God I baptized none of you, lest that you should say it was my own name. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not to baptize. Paul's job was not to go around water baptizing people. It's not your job either. Okay, people will say, well, there's someone you designate in the church to water baptize people. No, it's nobody's job to water baptize people. Because how are you identified with the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it by someone in your church water baptizing you? Or is it by one spirit baptizing you into one body? That's how you identify with Jesus Christ. Okay, he is one Lord over you when you hear the gospel, you trust it, and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's how he becomes your Lord you know, in the body of Christ. It's not through a ceremony with water. Right? So Paul, that's why Paul says, I thank God I didn't do it, and Christ didn't send me to do it. He sent me to preach the gospel. Lest the cross of Christ, you made an, an effect. Okay? It's the cross of Christ that makes Christ your Lord. Meanwhile, I'm spending a whole lesson on this. Let's move on to Ephesians 4, verse, what was it, verse 5 we're still at? One Lord, one faith. Okay? These things don't apply to everyone at any time, because you can find many faiths in the Bible. Now, they all have faith in God. Yes, this is true. And they all have faith in what God says. This is true. But the content of their faith, and when you talk about faith, you can't separate it from the content of the faith. Okay? Faith is not something you bubble up in yourself out of nowhere. Right? Faith is a response to what God said. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God has to speak. God has to say, here's what I say. What have you? That's the only time you can have faith. Right? If God never said anything to anyone, no one can have true faith in God. Right? And so only when God says things, people respond to him, they can they respond in faith. 
And Ephesians 4 says there's one faith, right? And so it's not just any faith, but the faith that Paul talks about in Philippians 1.27 when he says that he prays that you would strive together for the faith of the gospel. The faith, the singular one faith that we have in common. It's the same faith I have, the same faith you have, which is a big deal. Because again, in the church, what do we have? Well, you have your faith, I got my faith, and people got different faiths. And No, there, there's one. Well, yeah, there's different religions. They got their faith. No, there's only one. Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. And if you don't hear the word of God, you don't have faith. You've got some ignorant belief. A superstition is what the Bible calls it. A falsehood. The opposite of faith in the word of God is false belief. Right? And so there's only one faith whereby anyone could be saved today. There's only one word of God. There's only one faith that we're to believe. There's only one faith that we preach. There's only one faith, the gospel, the faith of the gospel. Okay. The faith then concerns Christ, where it talks about the faith of Christ. We don't have time to deal with the, the controversy around that, but it's this, the idea of this faith being a message. So the message concerns Christ, the faith of Christ, the faith of the gospel. All right. The requirement, by the way, for you to be an elder in the church, which is one mature in the doctrine, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 19, is what? Or 1 Timothy 3, verse 9, is to hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The faith. If that requirement was put in place at churches across the country, first, you've had a lot less deacons, right? And number two, perhaps you'd have better ones. Because if the requirement is that you not only have the faith, to know the faith that you're supposed to preach, but to hold it, which is what the endeavoring to keep is talking about, to hold the faith, and it's not just the faith, any old faith, but it's the mystery of the faith. You see that? This is holding the mystery of the faith. So it's not the faith that God gave to Moses that was prophesied. It's not the, God, the faith that God gave to the prophets, but the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So you hold the faith not in a lack of integrity, but in purity. This is the faith. This is the message. It was given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Apostle Paul, through this word, and we're to give it to you to grow up in it. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to destroy it. This is the faith, right? It's the truth is what it is. Faith is a knowledge of the truth. So Paul says, this is what we have in common. Don't we all want to come to knowledge of the truth? Even before we have an agreement on what that is, we should have the commonality that we want to come to a knowledge of the truth. You may think I'm wrong, I think you're wrong, but we both have that commonality. We start there, and then we come to the word of truth, and then hopefully by God's grace we can come together in the knowledge of the truth. Okay? That's, that's how that works. So you have one faith. Colossians 2, 6, and 7 says that you ought to be rooted and established in the faith. And in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, it says, quit you like men, stand fast in the faith. Right? So it's this message that we've got to keep. The next one's one baptism in the list here of seven unities, one baptism, which is weird that the verse says one baptism. As if there's one thing that divides Christians and Christianity, it's baptism in this doctrine. And churches are split based on how they baptize, in whose name they baptize, tech, you know, methods of baptism. So how in the world can the Bible say, how can the Bible be true if it says one baptism? I mean, that's right there, proof the Bible's false. And that's what you give your atheist friends, right? If they're looking for proof the Bible's false, it's Ephesians 4 verse 5 says one baptism, because everyone knows there's a hundred different baptisms, not just one. The scripture talks about 12, of course, and we've talked about this to, at various other times. Okay. But the Bible would not be true unless what we have in common is not the baptisms that everyone's talking about, right? Which split and divide. There's only one baptism we all have in common, and that is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. By one spirit, we are baptized into one body, which happens when you believe, Ephesians 1, verse 13. Romans 6, 3 says, No, you not, you are baptized into his death, which is what his body did which means you're baptized into his resurrection, which is what his body did after he died. You're baptized into his body, which means his death and his resurrection. That's the only one you need. That is the one that unites us all together. And for churches to say, well, the one baptism here is water, means that you apparently can be in the body of Christ without the one baptism that puts you there. Or if they make water baptism, the baptism puts you there, then that means you can believe the gospel without being in the body of Christ. Either way, it's wrong. 
The only baptism that occurs that's needful for you is the baptism by the Spirit into you, into the body of Christ, into in the church. Okay. One way you know, in combination with the one Spirit, that this is not what occurred in Acts chapter one verse five, is that our baptism. This is going to be something I hope you hear me on here. Our baptism is not about the Holy Ghost. Hmm? It's our baptism is not about the Holy Ghost. What was baptism about at Pentecost? All about the Holy Ghost. Christ went to heaven and he said in Acts 1 verse 5, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And you'll have power. And the Holy Ghost will teach you what to say and the Holy Ghost will give you power and he spoke in tongues. And so at Pentecost, what's the, what's the big deal? Every Pentecostal knows it was the Holy Ghost that came down from heaven. They spoke in tongues. They said, repent and believe the gospel or believe, repent and be baptized is what it said. Almost messed up the scripture there. It says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and receive the Holy Ghost. You see, the issue at Pentecost was the Holy Ghost. Your baptism is not about the Holy Ghost. Okay? It's about Jesus Christ. Your baptism is being you being identified with Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit does it. He performs it because it's by one Spirit baptized into Christ. But it's not the Holy Ghost that's the issue. It's Christ that's the issue. By the way, how does that work if it's the same baptism at Pentecost? If at Pentecost the baptism results in you having the Holy Ghost, how is it that Ephesians 1.13 says that you're sealed with the Spirit and the Spirit puts you into Christ? So which comes first, Christ or the Holy Ghost? Right? I mean, Christ was here first, then he sent the Holy Ghost. You get the Holy Ghost, he puts you into Christ, but Christ is gone. How does this, who comes first? What comes first is you hear the gospel and the Spirit puts you into Christ. Right? At Acts chapter 1, Christ was there first, and he went up and gave them the Holy Ghost. It's different. There are different baptisms. There are 12 in your Bible. Those are just two that, that, that concern or that, that talk about the Holy Spirit. But there are some 12 baptisms. Hebrews 6, verse 2 talks about baptisms plural. So, and then he says to go on from baptisms. Matthew 3 11 contains three baptisms in one verse. Jesus was baptized twice. The first time in Matthew 3, the second time in Luke 12, verse 50 is what he mentions. But there's only one that unites us. And that's our identification, which is what baptism means, our identification with Christ. Okay? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One God, which has always been, or monotheistic, Trinitarians, we believe the scripture and know the fullness of the Godhead and the Father, Son, and Spirit are not believing in three gods. There are one God, and Paul says this, Moses said that, everyone in the scripture says this, Jesus says this, okay? The Bible teaches one God, right? And the Father. Now the Father, which is one of the three persons of the Godhead, was made known by Jesus Christ, okay? There's always been one God, but people didn't always, did not always know the Father, they knew that God was the creator, right? But it wasn't until Jesus came where Jesus says, no one has seen the Father but the Son. And Jesus says, I came to declare the Father. And he comes to manifest the Father. And he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus came and suddenly we can understand that the Godhead was made of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So you find the teaching of the Trinity in the, in the Old Testament, but it's not directly manifest until Christ comes and starts teaching this, starts explaining it. And so there's one God and Father. There's only one Father. And it says in verse five, uh, 6 that he's the Father of all. So again, this is what we have in common, right? Uh, you, your Father is not the priest at the church. You have one Father, one Lord, and he's the Father of us all. So God made you, he made me too. Whether I like you or don't like you, he made me, he made you. So he's the Father of us all. All right. All is the key word in this verse. He's the father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Is there anything left out of that word all? Nope. Shouldn't that be unifying? That's like the word one, right? There's one. There's no division here. Right. Well, my father is different than your father. Nope. Not true. But there was a time in the Bible where that was true. Right? My father was Judah. My father was Levi. My father was Nebuchadnezzar. You know, uh, that mattered. At one time, that mattered. But now, it doesn't matter who your father was. There's one father of all. Okay, father of us all. 
And so we're all in the same boat in relationship to who, to, to who God is and to who we are in our relationship to him. The above all, where it says who is above all, has to do with authority. So we look up to God. Everyone looks up to God and that he is above all. There's no one uh, that can look down to God. He is above all things. Ephesians 1 taught us that when it says that when Christ rose from the dead, in Ephesians 1, he li was lifted above all principality and power and might and dominion, which tells us that Jesus Christ is God. Okay? Because if God is above all and Jesus Christ is above all, then who's above Jesus? Nobody. He's God. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Spirit is God. Okay? So above all has to do with authority or holiness. No one is as separate as God is, as special as God is. You are not. He is through all, which has to do with Ephesians 2 verse 18. For through him, through Christ, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So he's above all, but he's also through all. All things are performed through him. Romans 11.36 is what this reminded me of. When Paul praises Romans 11.36 that who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who, who, the depths and the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor, who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed to him again? Nobody. He's the creator. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Of him things have been. He's the creator. Through him things are and to him things will be. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, and we are all in his body, in his purpose, right? So through all, there's nothing that we can do as the church that's not through Christ. Thus, we do all things through Christ, right? So Philippians 4.13. Uh, there's nothing that I can say, well, I can do this one on my own. Nope, neither can you. So when you say, well, I can't really do this by myself, good, I can't either. We have to do these things through Christ, through God, right? That's the only way to get the, any of these things done. And of course, Ephesians 4 says not only through him, but he's not only through all things, but he's in all things. And we're not pantheists, which is the religious teaching of Eastern religion that says that God is in the pew and he's in the, my shoe and everything else. God is not in things, right? But it says in the verse of Ephesians 4 that he is in all things. What's it talking about? He, he's in you. Colossians 1.27 says the great mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so when we're looking at another brother and sister, someone we may disagree with, someone that has misbehaving, someone who just got saved, what do we know from the, the Bible? Christ in them, the hope of glory, right? This will also revolutionize your ministry work when you realize that who you're looking at is someone in whom is Christ, if they're saved by the gospel. This is not the world brotherhood of, of, of men. This is believers in the body of Christ, wherein the Holy Spirit of Christ dwells. Right? And so realizing that we're all members of the same body and that Christ is in you, that's a great mystery. And we can understand it according to the revelation of the mystery. And really, when you stop and think about it, and we'll stop here for tonight, in Ephesians 4, all of these things, where you count them as seven things or nine things or ten things, depending on how you count, all of these things, though they speak of the Spirit and the Son and the Father, all of these things are really because of Christ. And this is why Paul speaks more about Christ and why you're called the body of Christ and your gospel is called the gospel of Christ is because all of these things that bring us together is because of Christ. One body of Christ, right? One spirit, and it's called the spirit of Christ in Romans chapter 8. And it says in, in, in one, uh, uh, one hope of your calling, that hope you have is because of Christ, right? It's the hope found in Christ. One Lord is Jesus Christ, one faith of Christ, one baptism into the body of Christ, one God who is Christ, who is above all things, who is through all things, and who is in all of things that you are. Okay? So this is how you understand Colossians 2.9, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's by these things. All these things are a consequence of what Christ did and who Christ made you. Romans 8, let's look at Romans 8 and we'll stop here. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 32, 31 and 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Ephesians 4 says, 
we have in common, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, above all and through all and in you all. And in verse 7 it says, but unto every one of us is giving grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. This is where he's going to start talking about the differences. We'll pick it up next week. Or even though we have these commonalities, the differences are in the many gifts. There's only one Lord, there's only one faith, one baptism, but there are many gifts. Okay, we'll deal with this next week. The good news is in verse 7 is that the gifts, the, what's given of grace is according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And, and Romans 8 says, if God gave his son, why would he not freely give you all things? What we're going to see is Christians make a mess of this as well, is they make the gifts something that limits you, and it's not. What God has given you is all things in his son. So when you teach the gifts as something that's going to limit you and your ability, it's a problem. Okay? There's not just one gift. There's many. The many includes the abundant graces he's given us all. There's ones and there's many. You're many members of one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But there are many things God has blessed us with. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Okay. Any comments? Any questions? So I just got two impressions. Either we are baptized with Christ's death, burial, resurrection mm -hmm. into Christ. Either we are baptized with the Holy Spirit into Christ. I have like, like these two things. Like which one is the right one? I think. Sure. I think sure. you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you did this on Sunday. I got blamed on Sunday. They said you're 15 minutes late. That's Will's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're going to say draw the chart. Wait, do you have a comment to help her understand? That you're using the word with. Oh, okay. It might be confusing. So. Draw the chart. All right. Yeah. So you have the baptizer, the, the, the thing, the person who does the baptizing. Okay. Uh, the thing you're baptized into or uh, uh, with, right? And what you become. What's the result? Right? John... The Baptist was the baptizer, right? Into water. This is the simplest one to explain. What the result is, is what? Cleanliness. Yeah, cleanliness. Forgiveness of sins. Cleanliness or forgiveness. Okay. So that's the easiest one. So into water, this. Jesus was the baptizer at Pentecost. He said, I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Right? And what's the consequence? The power, right? He said, you'll have power many days since. I'll baptize you in, with the Holy Ghost, and you'll get power. Okay. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, by one spirit, the spirit, you're baptized into Christ. Right. What's that mean you become? The body. Right. And so this is Christ's cross, Christ's death and resurrection, the gospel of Jesus okay. Christ. Ephesians 1, 13. We went over earlier. It says, "Where uh, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise." Yep. So. Yeah. So here's belief. After your belief, you were sealed where? In the body. In the body. By one Spirit. Yeah. Right. Because by one Spirit, with the gospel of Christ, you put into one body. Yeah. Yep. And so it's, it's your belief there requires this belief here in the gospel. This is the thing. Before they could have power, they had to get the Holy Ghost. Right? He had to come first. Before they could be forgiven, they had to be water baptized in the water. Before you could be a part of the body of Christ, you have to believe the gospel of Christ. And the Spirit puts you there. Right? So this baptism, you don't feel this, you don't see this happen, you just read about it. You just hear this, you believe it, and then you read later, oh, apparently he put me there. You didn't even know. Right. So that, that's, that's the faith nature. You would know if you were dunked in water. <laughs> You'd know that. Uh, so that's a, a thing you see. This thing you don't see. Yeah. Faith. It gets less and less physical. Oh, yeah, yeah, through here. Yeah. yeah. More and more of course, you can see this, too. I mean, you can see the, you can't see the Holy Ghost here, but you can definitely see this, this result. Yeah. The power. Yeah. yeah. What people want to say is what happened at Pentecost, which is here. This is Acts 1. They say they want to make this the same thing as this. Right. Right. But Jesus said, I will baptize you. Here, the Spirit baptizes you. So this is different, right? And then it's, Jesus says, I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. 
right? And so they will say, baptism with the Holy Ghost puts you into the body, is what they want to say, right? With the Holy Ghost. But where's the gospel in this? There isn't. So the idea of, oh, well, the Holy Spirit is what gives you faith, or the Holy Spirit is what, you know, God has to give you the Holy Spirit in order for you to be a Christian. Um, well, that's this. <laughs> there, uh, right. I, there's a lot of folks though, that will that will disagree with that. What you just said in that those at Pentecost believed. So there's belief not in this above, there, above the Holy Ghost. Yeah, but they already believe. They, remember, they believed before Pentecost. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's there those right. that were saved at Pentecost. This is true. They heard it. And this is true. They and they were water baptized. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they repented. They were water baptized. And uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, they received the Holy Ghost, right? Yeah, see, so the, the, there's the whole thing in Acts 2.38. Repent and be ba water baptized in the name of Jesus and receive the Holy Ghost, and then they get here, right? And so Acts 2.38 is the whole list. But the, the people who received the Holy Ghost first, you're right, the people later was the whole thing. But first, they had already believed. They were, they were already water baptized, which is why they got this. They weren't water baptized again. They were water baptized in Jesus' ministry, believing in Jesus. And it was those people that believed in Jesus and were water baptized that received the Holy Ghost. Because it was this Jesus whom they believed in. They were water baptized, not in the name of John, but in the name of Jesus, right? He sent the Holy Ghost to them, right? And so, you see, this, this happened for this to occur, right? And so their, their belief came before um, the, the belief in Jesus and their water baptism came before the Holy Ghost was poured out. But the point is simply that these two things are different baptisms. Right. And so what people are trying to do is they try to take all of this, they make it one. In fact, the commentaries will say in Ephesians 4, the one baptism Paul says is this. Because uh, that's the only baptism they see in the Bible is water baptism. And, and this is the only one the church should do, right? And so uh, even though you read it, there's spirit, there's spirit baptism is plural, right? But that's an ordinance of the church. Remember he left two sacraments, Right. Luther said that, uh, baptism, Lord's Supper. So it's going to be this one. So the one baptism is this, is what all the commentaries say. And so when you're baptized by this, apparently, you, all this happens and you, you get all of it, right? The problem is that John says this is a baptism. Jesus says this is a baptism. In Matthew 3.11, which is the verse I quoted, this is all Will's fault, by the way. Thanks, Will. In Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water. But he that comes after me will baptize you, will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. How many baptisms is that? Two. Paul says there's one. I mean, he's got to say there's one is important. You've got to pick one, apparently, or something. But he says there's two. And there's a third one in that verse where he says he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, which is a judgment. That's nothing to do with the tongues of the fire. But there's three of them. There's nine others in the Bible. There's Jesus' own baptism, who he wasn't baptized into water for forgiveness. He was baptized into water to fulfill all righteousness. So it had a different outcome, which is why John first forbade him. John said, I can't do this. My baptism is for forgiveness. You don't need forgiven. Jesus says, do it anyway. I got a different purpose here. Different baptism. So you can't follow Jesus in his baptism. So there's many baptisms in the Bible, and this is what a lot of people just don't get. And so they're trying, you know, Christians are trying to conflate all of them. And that's why you're saying Christians... Well, they'll, they'll make, try to make sense of all of it together as if it's one. Well, it's not just one. There's, there's many. Just agree there's many, and then you just have to see which one unites us all. Right? If it were this, and it results in the power of the Holy Spirit, then how in the world do I know? I can't see the power of the Spirit in you all the time. But this is where the Pentecostals get the idea that if you're saved, it'll be manifested by speaking in tongues, or manifested by the power, because they get it from this. Right? Then others who are less Pentecostal say, well, you don't have to manifest the power. Well, then how do I know you have the Spirit? The Scripture tells me, by the Spirit, I'm sealed with the Spirit, and by the Spirit I'm in the body, it's all faith. Right? Well, what if you aren't water baptized? The Scripture tells me I was baptized into, into the body. Right? So, this, this makes sense? Yeah, I think I learned English. Uh, oh, this is English lesson, okay. <laughs> all that for a grammar lesson. Buy something, something is different. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is such an astute lesson for you to learn because there are scholars and PhDs who will tell you that is not true. Charles Ryrie in his book on dispensationalism, excellent book, 
uh, tries to combat what I just taught you, which is Pauline dispensationalism, by saying that the word by and with are the same. There's no difference. That's the only way he can do it, because it's by the Spirit. Here it's with the Spirit. Right? I'm telling you, that tells me how I know they're different. One way I know they're different. There's other ways I know they're different. You know, this here and this here, but those two, those two little, uh, what do you call them? The action, Propositions. The action in one comes from Jesus. And PhD. He wrote his own Bible. Comes from the, Spirit. the Ryrie Bible, right? <laughs> he said that these ultra dispensationalists, as people call us, right? They make a big deal about this thing here, and they think the only thing that we're hinging our belief on is a preposition, which is wrong, but they think that's all it is. So they think the prepositions make them the same. By and with the same. So what Paul's saying is, with the Spirit, we're put into one body. Like Jesus baptized with the Spirit. First, they change the word. Wrong. They mean two different things. But also, not only that, look what we're baptized into. And look at, and this, this is all different. It's not just a preposition here. So, anyway. Can't go on all night, can I? Someone's going to fall out a window somewhere. <laughs> I'm glad I brought my blanket. <laughs> She's got a pillow and everything. All right, any, any final thoughts? I wonder if Jesus had to draw charts for Paul, you know, in the Revelations. Well, the, you know, he's really sick, remember? Yeah, that's what I was about to say, yeah. They but, came and he's drawing in the sand. Yeah, I mean, it's like, <laughs> there had to be, you know, poor Paul, you know, he's just like, all right, one right. more time. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah. Well, this is why, you know, Paul says there was many visions, revelations that he came to. I mean, he didn't just talk to Jesus once. It was throughout his ministry that Christ was appearing to Paul yeah. and learning from him. And apparently there's things that you see that Paul learned and changed out his own thinking as well. So, yeah, no doubt it was not just a week here, yeah. the road on Damascus. But. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for all these great things we're learning in Ephesians. I thank you for every member of the body and those things that we all have in common, and things we can't take away from one another because you provided them freely by your grace. We thank you, Lord, that that brings us together and gives us a foundation to do ministry. I pray that we would all grow into a common understanding of the truth, the one faith of your gospel, that we would be able to minister it clearly to others and to see your will be done on this earth. Lord, we thank you for all things provided for us freely. Amen.